class yesterday, the three that quickly rose to the top of my mind were, number one, a culture of learning. And when we think of arts and science as a, a culture of learning, I like to think of this as well, as being intentionally part of a community of learning. So secondly, discipline, that is to say, focus, commitment, and hard work. And thirdly, creativity. It was this exchange in the dark, crowded, noisy, but excited atmosphere of the reception for the new cohort of arts and science students that prompted the thought that creativity would be an excellent theme for our winter lecture. A subsequent consultation with Dr. Wilson, our incoming program director, reconfirmed this idea. As we contemplated who best exemplified this quality of creativity, and who could articulate it in a knowledgeable and inspirational manner, Mark Chamberlain's name quickly topped the list of potential speakers. I have had the good fortune for over more than five years to serve on bodies chaired by Mark, in particular, the board of the Hampton Community Foundation and the Hampton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction. So I can vouch for these qualities firsthand. I'm very pleased that Mark accepted our invitation to deliver the 2011 Arts and Science Winter Lecture. Mark Chamberlain is no stranger to McMaster. He currently serves on McMaster's Board of Governors. The company of which he's president, Trevor Trevirus Limited, is located in McMaster's Innovation Park. It was indeed an early tenant of the Innovation Park. This is a commercialization company which is focused on transforming ideas from concept to sustainable companies and also social enterprises. There's a family connection as well with McMaster, insofar as his wife did her medical studies at McMaster and his son did a master's at McMaster. Mark's talent as a business entrepreneur has been recognized through many awards, including the 2001 Winston Young Ontario Entrepreneur of the Year Award in the Technology and Communications category, the 2001 National Entrepreneur of the Year Special Citation for Market Leadership, a Professional Engineers of Ontario Medal for Entrepreneurship in 2004, and his induction into Burlington's Entrepreneur Hall of Fame in 2006. He is at the same time a strong and consistent promoter of a culture of innovation as a way of addressing social problems. And it is in this capacity mainly that I know Mark. His roles in the local community have included, as I mentioned, serving as board chair of the Hamilton Community Foundation, and chair of the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, chair as well of the Jobs Prosperity Collaborative. He's also been a member of the National Council of Welfare an advisory body to the Minister of Human Resources and Social Development on matters of concern to low-income Canadians. He's currently chair of the board of Hamilton's Innovation Factory, the first, first hub in a series of 14 centres that will form the Ontario Network of Excellence, announced last November, if my memory serves me right, at McMaster's Innovation Park by the Ontario Minister of Research and Innovation. Mark Chamberlain was named Hamilton Distinguished Citizen of the Year 2007 and was inducted into the Hamilton Gallery of Distinction in 2010. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to this year's Arts and Science Winter Lecture, Mark Chamberlain. a little bit about um, engineering uh, 
my style of leadership to some extent, is that as a leader, I, um, I don't walk around with a pocket full of answers. I just don't have that capability. I'm not smart enough. Uh, I am smart enough, however, to walk around with a very full pocket full of questions. In other words, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve whenever we're uh, doing whether it be in a social or in a, in a business context? So in walking around these questions, and hopefully asking the right questions, because when you actually ask the right questions, um, you actually end up quite often, more often than not, striking a chord with folks around you who actually do have the talents and the capabilities and the knowledge to actually help you solve that problem or, or actually do something with it. So if I look at where my life has kind of evolved in the last 20 years or so, it's about how do I commercialize ideas, usually other people's ideas, how do I help commercialize those ideas in the business context, an idea to actually something like be sustainable as a product or a business. But in my role in the community, it's another way of commercialization. It's really how do you mobilize if ideas are really important, um, how do we actually increase the opportunity to generate those ideas? So I'm going to give you a little back. I'm going to walk through this here. I'm not a lecturer, Christine, so please consider this a discussion. I just have a bit of a uh, discussion after as well. So it's a discussion. Because again, I don't profess to be the expert. I'm actually only going to tell you um, things that are going on in my life, essentially, and how that might relate to creativity. Um, so I start off by saying, you know, maybe it's a bit of a problem-based approach. Uh, and you look at uh, this university in terms of its fame, and in many ways, is our way of looking at the problem first and then solving it, which is a really nice way of actually looking at some things. Um, and then you can talk about the need for innovation and creativity, where it comes from, how we enhance it, um, and, and speak to it. You know, and so when we actually talked about the, the, even the title of this, this, this talk, it wasn't until I actually finished writing all my notes that I would have changed it maybe a little bit. So it's creativity, to some extent, the competitive advantage. I'd actually maybe change today is creativity in its absolute requirement for survival. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So let me just kind of maybe paint a bit of a story first. And it's really the world that we're innovating and creating in. Uh, and it's just what we have. It's what we're doing. So you look at poverty. One of those areas that I'm very interested in for a whole bunch of reasons. But let's take a look. I'm on the National Council of Welfare. And what I found really interesting was about two years ago, we began to say we're going to get ready for our 40th anniversary fund and building time. Uh, our 40th anniversary. Now what was really stark for me at that 40th anniversary, as we were celebrating our 40 years of existence as a, an advisor to the federal government, was in that 40 years, 40 years ago, the poverty rate in, in, in uh, Canada was around 10%. 40 years later, in celebrating our existence, the poverty rate in Canada was about 10%. Okay? Just take that as a fact, that's where we are today. You look at Hamilton, and I've been involved in the Hamilton Roundtable with Gary now for about uh, five, six years. And we actually measure one outcome in that five or six years. We went from people almost not talking about poverty five or six years ago to actually at the last election in October, 80% of Hamiltonians said it was under one issue. That's a major change in thinking. Now, what do we do about it, and what have we been doing about it? But we actually look at the situation itself, the statistics of things that really kind of get me. In Hamilton, of 500,000 people, about 100,000 people live in poverty. And of those 100,000 people, 25,000 are kids under the age of 14, 15,000 are seniors, 15,000 are people who are actually working, who don't get paid enough. Another 15, 16, 17,000 are people who are disabled and are on Ontario disability benefits. So you look at that very broad group that we quite often think of, and we'll talk about this in terms of how we define the problem to some extent, but we look at that, we've also very often look at the problem of poverty as being someone's fault, someone actually too lazy to work. But if you look at poverty, and this is not unique to Hamilton, poverty generally is old people, young people, disabled people, and people who are working. Right? Um, when I think of the situation in terms of what it leads to, there was a wonderful project that was done, and I call it a horrible wonderful to some extent. It was a wonderful project that was taken on by a university uh, uh, prof here, uh, Jim Dunn, along with the uh, Hamilton Spectator. And what they did is they went through the city of Hamilton and said, let's go and map health outcomes about from people in terms of their backgrounds and what they're actually doing or not doing and how that impacts their health. And it comes out in this, this terminology called social determinants of health. Have you ever heard of that? Okay. Social economic determinants of health should be a standard teaching course for every single student. Plain and simple. It's as important as biology. It is in a sense biology. It turns out that the social economic determinants of health, about 60% of our, our health outcomes your and my health outcomes is influenced by the social economic health. Only about 40% is by our genetics. That's pretty 
pretty amazing when you look at our healthcare system over here. Hopefully. But the social economic values, all these things like housing, education, income, investment in children, investment in education, things of that nature, right? Well, it turns out when you actually look at us not underinvesting in those areas, essentially poverty, the other thing that happens in our communities is that we tend to uh, segregate by income. Talk about segregation and freedom and all those wonderful things, but in our own community, the community that we live in, the community here being taught in, and every other community in Canada and North America, and a lot of them in Europe as well, we segregate by the income. Don't we say, we're going to put the affordable, cheap houses over there, and if you make enough money, you can build over here? Well, that leads to is actually a really neat statistic. And that neat statistic is that you can actually measure people's health outcomes now by postal code. So we now have this thing called Code Red by postal code. If I go downtown Hamilton, I can say, here's the measures and the outcomes of people in downtown Hamilton, and here's where if you live in Ancaster, Dundas, Westdale, generally, the health outcomes. The difference in health outcomes in downtown Hamilton, a couple of just, and there's a whole bunch of them, these two ones really got me. One is, if you live in downtown Hamilton, and you live in poverty, you will on average die 21 years earlier than if you live in Ancaster, Dundas, Westdale. 21 years. Now, I don't know about you folks, okay? And we'll get to the whole creativity talk about it as well. I think that's disgusting, personally. It, it, it really it evokes me an amazing emotion of absolute disgust that we would allow that to happen. Because remember, a lot of those kids are kids. One of the wonderful profs here and researchers here, Gina Brown, based on all that kind of population health stuff, she can actually tell you by postal code today what the outcome of that child will be, how long they will live, the fact they won't go to school, they won't finish school, all those sort of things. Because in, in our city, we have a whole pile of kids. Think about yourself at the university trying to learn what you have to bet Kind of hard. So I, I raise this because this is the world we live in, okay? I don't like a lot of it, but this is the world we live in. The other fact is that if you live in downtown and those postal codes, you have a child, on average, your baby will be 50% lighter in weight than if you live elsewhere. Baby birth weight is also a factor. And there's a whole bunch of other factors like that. But what we basically are saying poverty, with all those social determinants of health, which we don't necessarily have to be not, which we clearly don't, affect people's lives significantly. Then you look at the environment, all right? I'm not trying to paint a really bad picture here, but we're going to actually we're going to talk about it. There is a new radio. The environment. And just picking out a couple of facts. These aren't necessarily the most relevant facts. They're not necessarily the only facts. But I, I raise them only because they're ones that really hit me as being like, wow, we can't even deal with that, right? So here's an interesting fact. From the Canadian Medical Association. In Canada, every year, 20,000 people die prematurely from respiratory disease because of smoke. 20,000 people. Now, when was the last time you heard about that in the news? Divide that by, by 365 days, you'll get how many people die per day in Canada because of respiratory disease early. That, to me, again, was one of those, I wouldn't just even call it an aha moment, as much as why does that not get where if there's one bird discovered anywhere in Canada that might have the West Nile virus, it hit the front page of every major national newspaper. We understand, and we did it was well publicized, and it should be, that we had C. difficile on our local hospital in St. Joe's, right, at the front page. Not one mention of how many people are dying, and that doesn't even include all the costs. We have another one of the project here called Allergy, an organization here. And the allergen, allergies, and things of that nature, the research they're doing, and what uh, Dr. Denberg actually speaks to, he says, this is like the canary in the mine shaft. You remember that story? He said the canary in, if it dies, probably you're going to die. Well, it turns out that allergen, the work they're doing, and all the horrific, in some respects, health outcomes that we're beginning to measure, allergies being one of those major pieces, is a great indicator of where we're going from an evolutionary perspective, and where we're going from an environmental perspective. Um, we had economic turmoil. If you, you look at our, our, our capitalist system, another one of the sacred cows. And I consider myself to be what I call constructive capitalism. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But when you look at the challenge we actually have today in the economic system, even folks like uh, Michael Ford, he's a business guru out of Harvard, even he would state today that our capitalist system, as we know it, has failed. It has failed. And you actually look at it and say, really, in some respects, rampant poverty. have the environment that we really should be afraid of. We have health issues that are not necessarily even being addressed, which we're beginning to understand. And we have a capitalist system that is taking us in a direction, and continues to take us in a direction, that actually aggravates all these issues. 
education. Hamilton, in fact, in Ontario, approximately 30% of students that start high school do not finish. And actually, the number's worse for boys. It's about 50%. Okay. That's amazing. It's amazingly bad. Think about the challenge we have as communities, as businesses, that we need talented, really good individuals in our workplace. And yet we have a system that literally filters out between 30 and 50 percent of our talent. Now, again, when we start talking, we move to the, to the idea of creativity, or we ask the right question, is the question that 30 to 50 percent of them simply can't hack it in school? Or is it, is our school system failing? In other words, does the school system, is it an indicator of the student versus the student? An indicator of something wrong with the school system? Question to ask. So we look at, to me it leads to a whole bunch of different questions. And it has a lot because of my work around the poverty roundtable. And in business, it's, it's no different. We have two challenges. We have, how do we actually create products and services? How do we create something that someone's going to want? Creativity. But when we look at it in a very broad context, it leads to me some really fundamental questions. Like, what is prosperity? What is health? What is happiness? Are we measuring the right thing? Is economic growth the only imperative and growth goal? Is the only way to measure how we're doing in society the GDP numbers? We should begin to look at what is it that's going to maximize human potential? What's going to maximize sustainability? So I think, if anything, that we're beginning to learn, and we'll move to that, is that we're not longer believing that we're living in an endless game of terms. We can do whatever we want, however we want, it is this endless. What we're really beginning to find out is that we're living on an arc. And it is limited. And it's crowded. And there's a lot of tight integration. So we begin to look at and say, this is the world